So our next speaker will explore a very important question, a great follow-up question to, to Alan's speech, the question of why the Constitution is worth defending. And you might actually recognize our next speaker, at least by name, if you are a regular reader of the Epic Times, because he publishes several pieces every single month, which often explore the, the meaning, the true meaning behind the Constitution. And by doing that, pretty much every week his writings do educate hundreds of thousands of people and have been uh, for the last several months uh, about the true meaning and value of the Constitution. So this man has already been defending America. And so this man, he is a former constitutional law professor. His research on the true meaning of the Constitution has been cited repeatedly by both Supreme Court justices as well as by the people who are actually arguing in the Supreme Court repeatedly. And he is the author of a phenomenal book called The Original Constitution, What It Actually Said and Meant. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce Rob Nadelson. I've been told 20 minutes, 20 minutes tops, and I've got a lot to say. So I'm going, to, <laughs> I'm going to do something which I normally don't do, and that is I'm going to actually read a speech to you. And hopefully we can get it all within the 20 minutes. I think before we make, before we make a decision as to whether to, to defend the U.S. Constitution, we need to ask ourselves whether the U.S. Constitution is worth defending. There clearly are many people today, uh, especially in the commanding heights of our society, big media, big tech, uh, the elite colleges and foundations, big government, big business, who think it is not worth defending. But they are wrong. They're not only wrong, they're grossly and tragically wrong. You can think of many reasons for their error, Maybe it's short-sightedness, intolerance, political expediency, financial interest, historical and constitutional ignorance. But whatever the reason, the important point is they're wrong. The Constitution has served us not only well, but brilliantly. And to the extent that it still survives, it continues to serve us brilliantly. Tonight, I'm going to offer you five reasons why I think this is so, and I'm going to start with a summary of them. First, with one significant exception, the Constitution has enabled us to avoid war among the American states. Second, by limiting the authority of the central government and providing that most powers are exercised elsewhere, the Constitution has provided the structure necessary to preserve freedom and ensure astonishing human progress. Third, the Constitution's Bill of Rights and other protector, protections for liberty have provided additional support for human freedom. Fourth, the Constitution represents a judicious balancing of interests, and I'll explain that later. Fifth, the Constitution's amendment process has provided the flexibility necessary for responding to structural problems, both old and new. Now, let's go through all five, one by one. First, on the issue of war. Since the Constitution was adopted, the United States has enjoyed a long history of peace among the states, broken only once. We all take this for granted. But to the, to the founders, war among the states and resulting foreign intervention was a very real possibility and a very real threat. And by the way, when I use the word founders, I don't, don't just mean the drafters of the Constitution. I'm including in this class the 1,648 people who ratified the document and everyone male or female, who played a significant role in the constitutional debates of 1787 to 1790. As I understood, as I said, the founders understood the risk of disunion. In disunited Europe, the previous 150 years had witnessed about 70 wars, and that doesn't count rebellions. The results were horrific. The Thirty Years' War alone 
may have killed upwards of 8 million people. The war of the Austrian succession resulted in perhaps half a million casualties. The Seven Years' War caused perhaps a million. And I haven't even given you the tally for the other 67 conflicts. Our founders knew the United States would eventually be a very large country. In 1787, it already was a very large country. And they were determined to avoid the bloody fate of Europe. They decided to create a central government that was strong enough and popular enough to ensure peace. This need for union was one of the reasons that they had to compromise with slavery, which, contrary to common mythology, most of the founders opposed. Throughout all but four of the subsequent 232 years, the Constitution has assured unity and the peace that has come with it. I don't need to remind you, any of you, what the record of disunited Europe has been in that period. On the other hand, the founders also understood that a free government fit to span a continent could not be a centralized government. They knew that the political system had to be sufficiently flexible to accommodate the needs and desires of different people, different cultures, different localities, different preferences. They knew that there had to be some check from below on the central power of the federal government. So they adopted a document that granted enough authority to the central government to keep the peace and to smooth out some of the bumps. And by the way, I don't mean that they smoothed out all of the bumps. Some of them would have been too costly in terms of flexibility and human freedom to smooth out, but enough of them while leaving control over the vast majority of human activities to states, local governments, private associations, families, and individuals. Thus, the second of the, of the Constitution's great contributions is federalism, or more generally, decentralization. It's a remarkable fact that many of the world's eras of explosive human progress have come in political environments of decentralization, even extreme decentralization. The awakening of the human intellect in fragmented ancient Greece, the quickening of trade and culture and rule of law and rise of living standards in the early Roman Empire, the flowering of arts of, and commerce in Renaissance Italy and Germany, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in relatively decentralized England, and the economic and technological takeoffs in 19th century Europe and America. Decentralization promotes creativity by allowing pe pe people to move to places that are best for them. Decentralization allows competition among states for creative talent. During the periods when the Constitution's constraints on federal authority were still honored, roughly 1789 to 1940, America not only became the world's greatest power, but a land of that explosive human progress. We, along with politically fragmented Europe, harnessed electricity, developed modern medicine, freed the slaves, emancipated women, and invented the telegraph telephone, radio, television, railroad, automobile, and airplane. The modern world depends heavily on the progress made during the era of decentralization. So, the Constitution created a government strong enough to keep the peace, but weak enough to permit human flourishing. Let's turn to, turn to its third contribution, which is more familiar, the Bill of Rights and other protections for liberty. For technical legal reasons, most of the Constitution's drafters didn't think a Bill of Rights was necessary. They believed that the structure of the document already protected liberty. But Patrick Henry knew human nature, and Patrick Henry disagreed. He urged Americans not to be satisfied with constructive, argumentative rights. 
He said that ordinary people needed a list they could turn to, read, point to, and rely on. They needed a specific Bill of Rights. Patrick Henry was wrong about the Constitution in many ways, but he was correct about the Bill of Rights. It was not enough that the original document, document protected, say, freedom of speech by implication, if indeed it really did. Those and other fundamental freedoms needed to be written into the document. Recent, docu recent events make us very grateful that they were. Peace, decentralization, the Bill of Rights, and other protections for human freedom. Now we come to the fourth contribution. This one is much more subtle. It's the Constitution's judicious and very successful accommodation and balancing of interests. In school, everybody learns, or used to learn, about the Great Compromise. Remember that? The Senate is, is allocated by states. The House of Representatives is mostly allocated by population. But there were far, far more compromises than that. And I'm not even sure the Great Compromise was really the greatest. The greatest might have been federalism, the middle ground between a unita unitary central government on the one side and a mere treaty organization like the Articles of Confederation on the other. But compromise, which was the greatest compromise, really isn't my point. My point is that the Constitution is loaded with compromises and accommodations, many based heavily on the lessons of history and what we would today call political science and public choice economics. For example, the Constitution's rules pertaining to the issuance of money represented a compromise. The terms of office for federal officials were a compromise. The grounds for impeachment formed a compromise between those who wanted impeachment for any reason and those favoring impeachment only for the most narrow of reasons. Incidentally, one of those grounds, high misdemeanors, was widely misunderstood during the Trump impeachment, but it was not misunderstood by Alan Dershowitz. The origination clause, requiring that tax measures be introduced first in the House of Representatives rather than in the Senate, was a particularly well thought out and very heavily debated compromise. The presidential election system with the Electoral College was yet another compromise, a carefully balanced plan adopted for numerous reasons of which most modern critics are blissfully unaware. The list goes on and on and on. But I'd like to illustrate one key compromise because it's a particularly important one, and that is how the Constitution handed, handled the issue of religion. There were two polar positions that the founders could have adopted. One extreme would have been to create what modern advocates sometimes call the godless constitution. This would have been a secular state of the kind French revolutionaries erected a few, few years later. There wasn't much support for this position because most people thought belief in God was necessary for self-governance. Tom Paine, a deist, might have liked it. And Thomas Jefferson, who most writers call a deist but was really more like a Unitarian, he maybe could have lived with it, too, although that's debatable. But Paine and Jefferson were both in Europe during the constitutional debates. And contrary to what you might have heard, nearly all the other founders were Christians, not deists. The other extreme possibility from the godless constitution was to emulate the governments of Britain and most of the states and create a constitution that while tolerating other beliefs, was distinctly Christian. The founders didn't do this either. So what did they do? Most people investigating the subject have focused on the background of the First Amendment or, on, or statements by people like Jefferson or, or James Madison, which is fine up to a point. 
But I think you get a clearer history of the Constitution's religion settlement by looking at what happened or how, uh, regarding two clauses in the original Constitution. One of these clauses required an oath for anyone taking office. And in the 18th century, you could not take an oath unless you believed in God. That was the law. And another of the Constitution's clauses banned religious tests for holding office. This was understood, as the South Carolina Ratifying Convention said, to mean that there were no religious tests other than a belief in God. The bottom line was that the founders compromised between sectarianism and, 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 and secularism. They built the Constitution on theism, not on any particular religion or religions. There are many sources supporting this conclusion. Among others, they include a successful letter written to the Constitutional Convention by a leader of the Philadelphia Jewish Congregation asking that religious tests not be put in the Constitution. During the celebrations over the Constitution's ratification, the organizers made every effort to make them as ecumenical as possible, including not just every Christian denomination, but the leader of the Jewish denominations as well. During the constitutional debates, opponents, opponents of the document assailed it precisely because it was non-sectarian. They argued that uh, the Constitution should limit office, holdings to, office holding to Christians. This drew powerful responses from the Constitution's advocates, including several Christian ministers. The gist of those responses was that belief in a god or gods was sufficient and that good people were to be found in every religion. They referenced favorably not only Christians and Jews, but Muslims, Hindus, and adherents to what they called natural religion. The compromise thereby accommodated the belief that good citizenship should include recognition of a higher power, but that higher power was not specifically the god of any particular religion, but the god of all. For the first time ever, Americans of all faiths could be first-class citizens, fully able to participate in government with full freedom of religion. So, so far I've mentioned the Constitution's contributions toward peace, decentralization, protection of individual rights, and judicial, judicious, judicious compromises. Now let's add the fifth one, and this is the amendment process. Surprisingly as it might, surprising as it might seem, most earlier constitutional style documents in the Anglo-American tradition had no provisions for amendment. But the framers knew that they were writing a constitution not just for a few years, but for the ages. So they inserted Article 5, which outlines the process for amendment. The records of the document's drafting and ratifications show that the founders had four reasons for including an amendment procedure. First, there might be drafting defects in the original document that merited correction. The founders were very great people, but part of their greatness was recognizing their own fallibility. Second, the Constitution is first and foremost a legal instrument. It is the supreme law of the land. The founders knew that any legal instrument must be interpreted and that, article, and that arguments over interpretation would inv inevitably arise. The amendment process could resolve those arguments. For example, if the public thought a Supreme Court opinion erroneously construed the Constitution, an amendment could correct the court. The founding generation did this exactly this by adopting the 11th Amendment in 1795. A third reason for the amendment process was social change. The, the Industrial Revolution had begun, and the founders knew that technological and other developments might make part of the original Constitution obsolete. And finally, Leading founders repeatedly prescribed the amendment process 
as a way to respond if government was abusive, overreaching, or dysfunctional. The founders proved prescient indeed because later generations have adopted amendments for all four purposes. Unfortunately, little editorial comment, there have been times in American history where we have allowed bad situations to become worse because we failed to use the amendment process. In January 1861, for example, the Commonwealth of Virginia called a convention of the states to propose an amendment to try to head off the Civil War. The convention did, in fact, propose an amendment. I think that if that amendment had been ratified, it might have prevented the Civil War and also put slavery on a path to extinction. But because the 1861 convention had no official Article V status, it could not send the amendment to the states for ratification. So the convention sent it to Congress as well. What does Congress do best in a crisis? Nothing. <laughs> so we eventually did adopt an amendment abolishing slavery, but 650,000 Americans had to die to win it. The lesson for today is obvious. Almost everyone agrees the federal government has become, at the very least, dysfunctional. Almost everyone agrees that decades of reform efforts have failed to correct or even ameliorate the damage. Almost everyone agrees that Congress will not propose constitutional amendments reforming itself. And every qualified scholar who has researched the issue in this century agrees that an amendments convention can be targeted at and limited to the necessary reforms. Yet year after year, we dither away our time rather than calling a convention, and the situation gets progressively worse. We have many reasons to celebrate our Constitution. It created a truly united states and gave us continental peace. It created a decentralized system consist consistent with human freedom and human thriving. It included specific protections for liberty, including, but not limited to, the Bill of Rights. It represented an extraordinary collection of judicious decisions on a wide range of topics. And because the framers understood their own limitations, the Constitution contains a procedure for amendment. Those, I submit, are some very good reasons why it is our duty and our privilege to defend the Constitution. Thank you. I'm here live in Philadelphia at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. When you hear the phrase, lives, fortunes, and sacred honor, these are the folks we should think of, those who anonymously gave their lives. Well, today you have a chance to volunteer. You need to volunteer for conventionofstates.com, the movement that's going to save the country. These folks were willing to step up and give everything. We need you to give just a little bit. Go to conventionofstates.com and volunteer today.